Welcome to To The Point. This is a program we were just talking about. We used to do maybe once every two years, and now this year we're on track to do it three times with two county clerks, Justin Roebuck from Ottawa County, and Lisa Possumus Lyons from Kent County. Thank you both again for being generous enough with your time to come back in. It's important because since 2020, the way we vote, where we vote, how we vote, when we vote, it's all changed. Mm. Uh, part of it in 2020 was kind of ad hoc, but by the time we started passing election changes and reform, here we are. So again, thank you both for being here, and let's start with the very basics. If you're gonna vote, you have to register. Justin, let me start with you. Sure. If I am in Ottawa County and don't know if I'm registered, or better, I don't think I'm registered. I don't remember registering. Sure. What do I do and where do I do it? Yeah, it's a great question. And really, you know, residents from all across the state, I always recommend michigan.gov slash vote. Super easy and simple website. You can go there and actually check your registration status. So you can check to see if you're registered. You can also check to see if your address has been updated. So if you've moved recently, uh, again, your driver license uh, change of address will also update your voter change of address, but it's just helpful, uh, helpful information there to make sure that you're registered. You can see where your polling location is, where the options that you have to vote. You can even apply for an absentee ballot by clicking on a link and filling out an application or downloading and printing an application for an absentee ballot as well. So there's a lot of resources there. Yeah, and I want to get more about addresses and change of addresses and that kind of thing. But Lisa, when, when you get ready to register, if you find out you aren't registered, or if you're registered at the wrong address, what do you do now? So it's a really important thing to, remind, to, to remember um, when you're registering to vote, you go to your local clerk's office, generally speaking. If you have had any, because we are now a state that has automatic voter registration, um, that, that will take care of itself. If you've had any transaction at a Secretary of State branch office, you know, be it for your uh, motor vehicle or anything like that, that will automatically register an individual to vote unless they've opt out, opted out. Uh, but by and large, you will go to your local clerk's office to register. Um, and again, you can find uh, your local clerk's office at, uh, in Kent County. We go to Kent County dot, uh, kentcountyvotes.com. Um, and that will take you to uh, all of our local clerks and give you the contact information. It'll let you see if you're registered to vote. Um, but if you are not, you want to get with your local clerk uh, or you could fill it out online. You can register online or at your local clerk's office um, and you will just then be added to the voter rolls once you've proven your residency, of course, and, and your identification. And One of the things I was thinking about as I was preparing for this, because not in a long, long time, but there was a time in my career that I moved rather frequently and it was from state to state. Mm -hmm. So let's pretend that somebody just moved to Michigan from Kansas and they have not registered to vote. A, is there a length of time that they are required to be a resident before they can register to vote? Yeah, so there is no length of time for residency any longer, particularly because we now have same day registration. So. As we're getting close to this August primary, we're now 27 days away as we're, as we're at least recording right. this right now. But and, as, we, and we are counting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as we're getting closer to this, this um, August primary, uh, it's important to note that 14 days away from any election, the only place that you can go and register to vote is with your local clerk's office, uh, 14 days and fewer. So, uh, but there is no length of time that it's necessary for someone to be uh, a resident, they do have to, within that 14 day window, uh, show some verification document essentially to prove that they do live where they say they live. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that verification process, but you mentioned something a moment ago that you can fill out or download and then fill out a form to get absentee voting ballots. That's important because we now have this 40 day stretch, is that right? Well, if you're overseas or military, it's 45, but right. yes. But for, for most of us, yeah. no reason, absentee, for all intent and purpose, it's early voting in Michigan. And if you sign up for that once, that can be a repetitive kind of thing, right? 
Absolutely. That I was kind of going to piggyback off Justin's comments about voter registration um, because we now have uh, what's essentially automatic absentee ballots um, going out to an individual, a voter who has signed an absentee ballot application and checked the box that they want to have an absentee ballot delivered to them um, in all future elections in perpetuity uh, rather than prior to these voter changes every time an individual wanted an absentee ballot they had to send an application in first. We are no longer, uh, you know, we're no longer operating under that policy due to uh, voter approved um, ballot proposal in 2022. Um, so that is why it is so important that you are checking your voter registration, that if you move, you're updating your voter registration, you're updating your driver's license, which would then automatically update your voter registration. Um, you know, this, because of all these changes, it is so important that our voter list is up to date, it's accurate, it's functioning, and it's well maintained. And of course, election officials, our local clerk's office, um, do a great job of maintaining the voter lists on their end. But with all these changes, there's a role to play uh, by our voters in making sure our lists are accurate. And that is making sure that they are updating all of their information every time they have you know, a change of address. I, and I started to make an assumption that I have no basis in fact for, so I, I guess I can't assume. It just appears to me if you move, the, one of the first things you would do would be update your driver's license, but maybe it isn't. Maybe people right. uh, d don't think in those terms. So now I have moved. Hmm and I want to go vote, and I haven't gone to the websites, but I still got my voter registration card. Yeah. I still have my driver's license, but I show up at the wrong poll. Yeah. And what do we do then? Yeah, no, great question. So essentially what, what happens then is because we have same day registration, there is an opportunity for voters to correct that and essentially update their voter registration in real time. So if you have moved into a jurisdiction um, you, you're, and not registered, you're able to go to that local clerk's office, uh, even on the day of election up until 8 p.m. But you have you, to go to the clerk's office. Yes. That's right, it does not happen at the right. precinct, it happens at the local clerk's office. And then you have to show some identifying information, right? You have to show a photo ID, you have to show proof of the address where you live, so a utility bill that would indicate that you're receiving bills at this address, so other uh, not only the photo ID, but also other identifying information that would say, yes, this voter, this person lives here. And then the, the, the clerk is using a, a secure database, which is updating in real time uh, and the qualified voter file and looking to see and verify, you know, when was the last time this person registered to vote, right? You're not just bouncing around from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Right. So we can see uh, that voter's record and, and make that change in real time on election day, and then they can go cast a ballot. I'm woefully unprepared. I do not have a utility bill. I have, at minimum, I have my driver's license. I show up someplace. Can I still vote? Uh, you will be given a provisional ballot at, at that point. Um, that's, that's uh, we, because we don't turn, we don't generally turn people away from the polls unless you're at the wrong location and then you'll be directed to the right location. Um, a provisional ballot is issued and uh, that will not be counted until uh, the voter then provides the documentation that's, that's necessary to allow that vote to count. Yeah, absolutely. We have to prove that that person is a registered or is a resident of the place they say they are and the local clerks have a period of, uh, of time to do that. Uh, six-day mm -hmm. window in which they can basically do that work and that ballot will or will not count based on that information. One of the reasons we are doing these shows is information, but the other one is to provide a little clarity and transparency. So I'm going to ask you a devil's advocate question. We now have this system where I'm going to get an automatic absentee ballot in perpetuity, as you point out. Let's say I move to Florida. I don't bother to cancel my registration. I don't think I ever did any time I ever moved. So I'm living in Florida and I'm blissfully ignorant that at my old home address, I'm getting an absentee ballot every year. 
Does that concern you? Is, is, is that a part of concern? It is a concern. It's absolutely a concern when ballots are being sent to individuals that are no longer eligible to vote in our elections. Uh, but that's why it's so important that we have these checks and balances in place in our process um, and that you know, and that our election officials are, and, and we do a great job, uh, our local clerks do you know, a masterful job at administering the elections according to law and best practice. Um, but before a ballot is ever, um, once it's received by the local clerk, is uh, before it's ever, um, you know, approved to be uh, tabulated, um, the voter has to sign the back of the the back of the absentee ballot envelope, and that signature is basically the key that unlocks the absentee vote, uh, so to say. That signature on the absentee ballot envelope is com uh, cross-referenced by the local clerk with the signature that we have on file in the voter database. If those signatures match, that ballot is accepted and will be tabulated um, in the absentee county board. If the signatures don't match, the ballot's rejected uh, and the uh, clerks are required to notify the voter that they have three days to uh, remedy the uh, signature. And um, that, is, that is an important check and balance. Um, you know, again, we also have, because sometimes signatures don't match and it's not a fraudulent situation. It's a matter of an individual aging, uh, an individual using their you know, middle name or middle initial when it's not you know, Injuries that could affect truly, a signature. Truly, there are like logical explanations why a signature wouldn't match. And so, uh, but we don't want to take that for granted. We don't, we don't want to make any uh, presumption. And so we are required to verify that signature. If it doesn't match, it's rejected and uh, the voters notified and they have an opportunity to remedy that situation. If the voter says, I never, I never voted, I never sent an absentee ballot, um, then that triggers, you know, law enforcement uh, law enforcement initiation so a, a clerk would then engage law enforcement to investigate that situation and those are the situations that you and your fellow clerks are trying to avoid we're going to talk more about this primary election now this is a big presidential election year but this is the primary election and when we come back we are going to talk about why you can vote for a democrat or a republican but you can't vote for both we'll be right back to the point Welcome back to To The Point. We're talking about voting in the primary in Michigan, and it's already going on right now. We talked about the early absentee voting. So we talked about a couple of ways. You can send in the application. Maybe you've already sent in a perpetual application. So you get that ballot. How can you return it? There is more ways than one. Yeah, there are, there are multiple ways that a voter can return their absentee ballot. So first and foremost, you can do it like we've always done it, using the USPS. Uh, the, the, the system of mailing your ballots in has been done for about 175 years in Michigan. And uh, what I would always say to voters is when it gets to be about 10 days prior to the election, don't mail your ballot. Just be sure that that ballot is going to count and get, get to the clerk's office on time by either taking it in physically to your local clerk, using a drop box in your community at the city or township hall or other location where that might be, and make sure that you get it in that way. Um, you can also check uh, at michigan.gov slash vote to see whether the clerk has recorded receiving your absentee ballot. And that's a great feature for folks just to know, yes, my ballot is there and it's going to be counted. But voters can also return their ballots now, their absentee ballots, in other ways. So during early voting, you can actually take your voted absentee ballot with you uh, in an early voting precinct, walk up, be verified on the poll list of voters, and actually run that absentee ballot through the, the election tabulator yourself, as well as on election day. So voters can actually take their election or their absentee ballot in with them on election day and cast that absentee ballot that way. In and the those are new. Right, in the past, if a voter brought in their absentee ballot uh, to the polls on election day, uh, the election uh, inspectors would take that ballot, uh, spoil it, and issue them a new oh. in precinct uh, ballot for them to vote and so that's again we keep that uh, yeah we keep that um, in a secure you know envelope in the container and that's also that's kind of vetted out at our canvas level um, but yeah so now uh, with this change there's no longer that spoiling of a ballot and reissuing an, a new one talk to me about drop boxes that is a relatively new 
um, aspect of voting uh, here in Michigan, and you see them around a lot of different places, and I, I assume that some there are additional during this time period. What is that? Is that? Uh, tell me about the security. Tell me about the locations and how that works. Drop boxes are actually nothing new, especially especially in Kent County. Um, virtually yeah. all of our uh, local jurisdictions had a drop box prior to the pandemic. Even um, most of them are uh, located, you know, on the grounds of the uh, jurisdiction's city or township hall. Uh, but they are not new. They've always been a convenient way for voters to um, for voters to return their absentee ballots. But with that pandemic, you had a huge surge in absentee voter participation uh, starting in, in 2020. Um, you know, also with the you know new, no reason absentee voting. There's a whole combination for why there were so many uh, voters casting absentee ballots. So, to a lot of voters, uh, the idea of a drop box was new. It was novel, um, and so uh, that got a lot of attention in the past. For us, it's nothing new. But what what is new as a result of 2020 and some of the some the attention that was drawn to it and I think really uh, a positive change is making sure that those drop boxes have enhanced security they have uh, you know video footage um, they are required to have you know this chain of custody documentation for who has you know who has emptied the drop box uh, what you know what the ballots what were the time it was, time it the was. Um, and they're required to do it on a regular consistent basis and so the fact that we've kind of put these um, put these extra uh, extra parameters around the drop box usage um, and security measures I think is is a truly a positive um, change that we are um, that we're excited to have voters um, just have that sense of uh, trust and confidence that those are secure my vote is going to count and um, and and this is a positive way to ensure that uh, that I can return my absentee ballot if it gets too late to mail so the absentee ballot is something that people I think are somewhat familiar with, getting more familiar with no doubt because of these new parameters. One of the things they may not be familiar with is early in-person voting. And if I have this straight, it's nine days and then 10, including election day. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about Ottawa County. Yeah. I live in Ottawa County, which I don't, and I want to go vote. I want to do it in person, but I don't want to do it on election day. I want to do it, you know, nine sure. days out, where do I go? How do I know where to go? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and, and we do do things a little bit differently in Ottawa and Kent. And because of the way that the, the constitutional amendment was passed, there's really a lot of variation across the state of Michigan with how early voting works. Uh, but in Ottawa, we are nine days. So there's a minimum of nine days. Uh, jurisdictions can actually individually uh, select more than nine days, up to 29 days. Um, but I think most jurisdictions around the state of Michigan are at nine. So in Ottawa County, beginning on July 27 for this August primary, uh, voters will be able to cast an, a ballot early at an in-person early voting location. Four locations geographically sort of spread out across Ottawa County, and anyone uh, in the county, any resident of the county can go to any of those four locations to cast a ballot. And so it's very much set up like a precinct would be. Uh, we have bipartisan teams of election workers there who take an oath and they they are assisting our voters walking in, checking their names off of the poll list. They'll issue them the ballot that is for their jurisdiction. They go and actually are able to cast that ballot in a tabulator. But that's not necessarily the place you would go on a normal basis to cast your vote. Yeah, right? very so, good point. So people have to kind of be aware of that, but you can go to any of them. What about Kent County? Yeah, in Kent County, we're doing things a little differently um, because this is the first run at early voting. Um, you know, we have, we have uh, just over 518,000 registered voters. Um, and it's the first time that early voting is being unrolled to our uh, statewide to our voters. Um, you know, we've always been a decentralized uh, election state. So uh, what we're doing in Kent County is each of our local jurisdictions is operating their own um, early voting site for their own voters. Um, you know, there's pluses and minuses to uh, centralizing uh, or, or doing it um, decentralized as Kent County is doing. But for us, um, at this point, with so many changes happening, we know um, that our local clerk's office, our, our local jurisdictions, the voters know those areas. And so we think 
as of right now, that's where the voters should go. And so um, we're doing uh, each of our individual jurisdictions. Um, we have to get a baseline. We really don't know what early voting is going to look like. Um, and this is, this is the perfect election cycle to, um, to unroll that and to kind of get a baseline for who is going to come out and vote early. Are they going to be new voters? Are they going to be voters who used to vote absentee but want to come in early? Or are they going to be, be uh, election day voters that are just going to go, they want to go in person, but they want to get it done and over with. Uh, maybe don't want to deal with um, risking a snowstorm or deal with a potential line. So there's a whole bunch of different factors that I think there's going to be a lot of analysis yeah, done, yeah, not just sure. by election officials, but by campaigns and pundits alike. Oh yeah, um, you know the campaigns yeah, will be so, watching that. So mm -hmm. until we get a baseline, um, to figure out who's who's voting early and uh, what is the best method to do that. You know, our local jurisdictions is what our voters know and that's where they should go. And kind of to, to play off of that, you didn't know what to expect about early absentee voting. Obviously in 2020 it was a big deal because 2020 was just a mess. Uh, but since then, have you both seen the percentage of absentee voting and early absentee voting continue to remain relatively high? Oh, yes. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. I mean, we, we've gone through so many changes, right? In 2018, that was the first year where Michigan had no reason absentee voting. And really that was in November of 2018. So 2019 is a small election year, right? Cities, municipal elections possibly. And then we get to 2020, and then we have a global pandemic and a whole lot of people are interested suddenly in, in pursuing the option absentee ballot. And I think we, we saw kind of a high watermark there during a couple of those elections in 2020. And now I feel like it's leveling out. And I think one, one point that I don't think we've made it, I mean, a lot of these changes are really positive options for voters. And it's great. It's really, it's a convenience issue. You know, voters able to sit down at their kitchen table and fill out an absentee ballot well, they've got Google up or they're, you know, be able to research Doing what's their research on their ballot they, yeah. and vote in the privacy of their own home. That's great. And so I think in states where this is, this is more of a, uh, you know, the policy for absentee voting is broad, we see a large percentage of voters wanting to use it. And so Ottawa, we're, we're roughly, you know, 45 to 50 percent of our voters are utilizing absentee ballots. And I think that's probably where we're going to you know, stay in the long run. So where you're tracking and then- you Yeah, uh, again, again, as Justin said, it was 2018 where the voters approved um, no reason absentee voting and and that pandemic ushering, ushering that into a presidential, a pandemic year was just skyrocketed. Um, and so I do think that was obviously a, a high water mark. Um, they've gone down a little from 2020, but I, I don't think we'll ever see the days where you've got 25 to 30 percent of your uh, voters are, are casting absentee ballots. I think it's going to remain higher than that. Um, and so I, that's just kind of the yeah. new world and we're just going to make sure that we're implementing these checks and balances so that it's secure. Exactly. I will get this phone call on election day to be sure and maybe before. When I go in to vote, I can vote in the primary for Republicans or Democrats, but I can't cross over the line. That's really all they need to know, right? Stay in your lane. Right. <laughs> all right. We're gonna we're gonna talk briefly more when we come back. We're out of time this week, where we would have a big discussion about turnout, but we don't have time for that. So Lisa Posthumus Lyons, Justin Roebuck, County Clerks, Kent Auto County. Thank you as always for your time. I'll see you guys back here in September. <laughs>